to welcome uh, Professor Mohammed Karim from the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. Um, and, and before I run through his brief biography, I will tell you uh, something that I discovered in his biography that we, we have sort of loosely in common. About the time he was finishing high school and starting college in Bangladesh, I was in high school in Pakistan, and, and we got caught on either side of a war between, which turned out to be the War of Independence for Bangladesh. Yes. So I'm, I'm very delighted that you made it through that. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I remember those were, were dark days on both sides of the border, um, but it is just wonderful to meet you, even if it's virtually at this point. Uh, you. Professor Karim has had a distinguished career. Uh, he's served in a number of different places. He's been director of the electro-optics at the University of Dayton. Um, he's been dean of engineering at the City University of New York. Uh, head of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Tennessee, um, and also has served in a very distinguished way in the administration at, the, at his current institution, the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Uh, despite all that in, in administration, he's had uh, amazing and wonderful technical contributions uh, that include optical in, information processing, displays, pattern recognition, um, He's been recognized by IEEE, Africa, SPIE, the Institute of Physics, uh, Institute of Engineering and Technology, um, AAIA as fellows, and also the Bangladesh Academy of Sciences. Uh, so he's here to, to share with us a, a subject that's a little different than our normal colloquium, uh, but it's something I'm very interested. I'm actually giving this introduction uh, from the uh, very old seats of Middle Eastern civilization in Istanbul that goes uh, certainly back to the Ottoman Empire uh, and the Greek Empire and the Romans. And he's going to talk to us about the history of optics and especially some of the contributions of the history of optics from the region that I'm familiar with and that I'm sitting in now. So, Professor Karim, we're looking forward to this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate joining you, though virtually. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, and the topic chosen is photon chaser. And the first thing that I would like to I would like to see if uh, let me see if I can go forward. Something is preventing me from going forward. You try to reconnect. Uh, we can get off and come back again. Okay. I, I'm you're going to join in, in a minute. Okay. I'm going to rejoin again. Okay. Share it. Okay, we're seeing it in presenter mode now. So we see that, but. But this is a, it's a new problem. We have never had this problem before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we didn't check this. We just looked at the, the screen is showing up and we stopped at that point. But, so you cannot uh, go advance. I mean, you're saying you cannot I advance. Cannot, I, it looks like I cannot advance. Huh. But, uh, oh, no, I did. You got you it. See okay, so yeah, so so we can see it, but it's in presenter mode. Um, oh, so there's there's a way to adjust the display. Yeah, so you have to go to the, the uh, screen. not the presenter mode, but the. I mean, your, your screen actually is as a. You have to go to the mode you were before. I think you were in some mode before where we had the full. I screen. was exactly in this mode. Really? Okay. Yeah, exactly in this mode. Okay. 
Yeah, I see. Okay. Should I go ahead? You think? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I guess we don't want to really miss it. Uh, okay. but, but right now, we see your uh, second screen on the side. Half of the screen has a same slide duplicated as the presenter mode. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. Uh, so, but it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, only... well, I think I, I go back to my for presentation with Isaac Newton, who obviously we all know, who discovered gravity. Uh, supposedly an apple was falling somewhere and he suddenly discovered gravity. But I think where we were trying to get today is that I have, he used, he did say that I have, see, if I had seen a little bit farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of many other people. And the, those many other peoples that typically start from Greece and essentially the way we have uh, been taught is that everything good starts in Greece. And so obviously is a list of people, Socrates, Pythagoras, Zeno, Euclid, Archimedes, and Ptolemy. What never gets said is of these six giants that I have listed, two of them were actually never in Greece. Euclid and Ptolemy was actually in Egypt. Both of them lived in Alexandria. But I think the historian of science try to ignore that fact so that they are all lumped within Greece in uh, the mainland of Europe. And you will see that uh, the two pictures that I've shown on the right side is the Euclides and Ptolemy. These are the two who are act essentially the contributors from the modern area of Egypt in the former city of Alexandria, which uh, used to be occupied by Greece at some point in time. And then the history book tells us something magic happened. And after Greece, we suddenly came to Galileo. And there's about some 1,200 years in between how we came about either to Galileo or Newton. It is uh, never stated. But that's how the typical story of history of science progresses. But this is if I were to go to Central Asia or a little bit beyond, and this is a picture taken from satellite. And I think there are a couple of things that are important to recognize that this, if you look from the space, there are no non-traversable natural barrier, barriers like oceans. Himalaya mountain is farther to the east. There are passes between the mountain and ranges that allow typically to move from the east to west direction. And this trade route is important for understanding the history of sciences. So we are going to very quickly review art of counting, mathematics everywhere else. And I, in particular, I will go beyond Greece to China, India, and Central Asia. And then I'll talk a little bit about the beginning of experimental science and possibly then the birth of photonics and the first experiment. So Roman numerals, it requires no introduction, but it is a mix of both addition and subtraction between positions in a relatively a clumsy fashion, and it didn't have a symbol or a concept for zero, at least up that point in time. Arithmetic using is also complicated. If I looked at this particular table, for example, you will see that certain numbers are added, but certain numbers are subtracted. It depends, am I going to the left or if I'm going to the right, just to elaborate this, this example, if I were to write 72,487,963, I start from the left, but as soon as I go to four, instead of putting C, D, actually what I do is D minus C. And farther down when I come to 900, I, instead of 900, it's actually a thousand minus 100. So these are the clumsy nature of Roman numerals that prevented us from progressing with mathematics to the way I, we like. So if I go even before the Greeks, and I, if we go to the Chinese stick numerals, this goes to about 11th century BC. They were originated with bamboo sticks on flat board, positional based on somewhat of a 10 scales. There is no notation for zeros. Blank was interpreted in modern times as that's what it meant by zero. We do not know, we will not be able to tell for definite. But I think we, the important things to realize is this 
for about eight centuries from 10th to 2nd BCE, the Chinese mathematics are summarized really in a book, an amazing book is the nine chapters on the mathematical art. The Chinese name is Zhuzhang Shuan Shu. It was actually compiled in 263, we'll talk about that. And this chapter in mathematical art is really about 246 problem, had nine chapter in it, and possibly is the greatest Chinese classics in mathematics. And if I look at this nine chapter, I just look at the nine title, and you will see these are very practical. Chapter one is about serving land. The second one is about rice and crop and you know, maize, and then distribution by proportion, short width, civil engineering, that leads to construction. You can almost figure out in you know, a great wall of China, everything in there fair distribution of goods, how to calculate profit losses, calculation by square table and right angle triangle, which I'll interpret to be in our times is like Pythagoras theorem. So these nine chapters of Xianzu's book were actually from before Greece. The nine chapters was compiled by Liu Huang Hui. And Liu Hui, by the way, in addition to compiling, he himself uh, discovered two things. One is discovered Gauss-Jordan elimination method that we know now, except it was 1500 years before Gauss, precisely. And then he is the first to calculate the value of pi by putting 192-sided polygon within a circle. That's the most he could get. And his number is 3.1410014, pretty close to where it should be. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Indian mathematics. And there are a lot of them. They are a little bit in the, in the after the birth of Christ. But I want to list at least two of them who are possibly the most significant, Arjovata or Aryavata and Brahmagupta. And the years are kind of noted. Uh, Aryavata is that he estimated pi, but he does it something differently. He is actually divide 62,832 by 200,000, sorry, 20,000 comes to 3.1416. He preferred to use the square root of 10 to approximate pi. Important, he calculated the circumference of the earth thinking it's like a sphere, and he calculated 62,832 miles. He believed that, by the way, he believed there's no proof. He believed that the orbits of the planets are all ellipses. The second person that I want to list is Brahmagupta. And Brahmagupta is the first person who perhaps defines zero as the result of subtracting five horses from five horses. But what is important, there's no zeros yet, but he was able to solve equations of the form, which in modern days, we could say a quadratic equation of the time type, ax squared plus c is equal to y squared. He discovered also the area of cyclical quadrilateral where he puts a quadrilateral within a circle and calculates its area, which we use actually in current day, we use in mathematics where a, the area, is S minus A times S minus B times S minus C times S minus D, where A, B, C, D are the lengths of the sides of the quadrilateral within a parameter. The next thing that I want to tell you, I'll just go jump beyond uh, this period. And this is perhaps, is a different time. It's when the first organized research, up until this point in time, everything that happened in the past was because individual were interested in doing something. First organized research was led, happens to be in modern Iraq. It was a major library and created by Khalif al-Mansur between 754, 775. And the challenge was to bring in all the manuscripts from China, Greece, Persian, Sanskrit from India, Syria, all the books, and the books will be translated. And the caliph was essentially, if you could bring the book, but if you could translate the book, then he will give 
the weight of the book in gold to you because you just managed to translate the book. That was one phase for about 25 years. And when I say first organized research, you can almost think this to be an early version of a research lab, which actually took a vital hikma for the next 50 years by the next caliph by Al Mamun. This is called House of Wisdom. This is when they were organized, no more in translation, but organizing research in mathematics, astronomy, and philosophy, and so forth. So this is like a modern version of a national lab, you might say. And organized research is where Khalif is the funder, who happens to be the National Science Foundation in those days' time. I go back to four particular mathematicians. There are lots of them. Four that are important. One name, obviously, you can all see at the bottom, Omar Khayyam, who is more known here in the West because of his poetry. But the first person is Al Kharizmi. These are the people who formalize algebra and trigonometry. And the most significant four are these four. So I want to, to tell how did this happen? Well, it's partly because of this map that I showed earlier that their problem that they wanted to solve had to do with finance, communication, calendar, transportation, construction, pilgrimage. And because they're praying in the direction of Mecca, they needed to find which direction the city of Mecca is. Taxing, division of the properties, serving, and how to write contracts and decision-making. These are the reason why algebra got created in the fashion. Abyssinia is a name is a polymath. And all I wanted to kind of tell you that is a polymath like in those days where the same person would be a physician, is a physicist, is an astronomer, if everything. So Abyssinia in the world is known more because of his contribution to surgery. So essentially for treatment, but he is a big polymath who actually contributed to a lot of uh, algorithmic or algebraic uh, enunciation. This is perhaps the one that I want to spend a little bit time, Al Kharizmi, and his a very long name. The last is Al Jawarzmi or Al Kharizmi, meaning this man is from the area of Kharizm or Khorashan. And he's known in by various names Al Kharizmi, Al Kharizmi, Al Kharizmi. And what is important that, uh, that well, by the way, stop is his statue at the bottom is a, uh, is a stamp that I was produced in Soviet Union. But what is important, his word, algebra, came from algebra. In the title of the book, which was created in 825, the long title, Al-Kitab Al-Muhtasar Fi Hisab al jabr al muqabala two things important. al jabr means restoration, and al muqabala is reduction. So this is how the left side is moved to the right side and vice versa, and how you eliminate things. These ideas were, and all we got stuck with this part in red, al jabr and we now know it's called al jabr His English translation in modern day is, if we are not interested in Arabic, is the condensed book on the calculation of Al-Jabr al muqabal Next slide. What is important to understand, al kharizmis algebra book. That's one piece, an algebra book. You are not seeing a single equation. In part because none of his book look like modern uh, algebra. Everything is written entirely in prose with none of the symbols we use today. And I'm going to give you one example so that we can look at this. Problem formalism. This is how it is formulated in prose. If from a square, I subtract four of its roots and then take one third of the remainder and then finding this equal to four of the roots, the square will be 256, which is actually 16 square. So really what he meant, he explained in the following fashion. Since one third of the remainder is equal to four roots, one knows that the remainder itself will equal 12 roots. Therefore, add this to the four roots, 
giving 16 roots and the 16 is the root of the square. So in modern days, this would mean exactly this. One third time X squared minus four X equal to four X. And he basically showed how to solve that X is equal to 16, except in it's in the form of a prose. And all his books are like this. So if you're looking for the question, you're not going to find anything, but he is the first one who was early, was, is that it is at a rhetorical state, no symbol and no negative or zero coefficient. And he used Al-Khwarizmi, used geometric proofs to solve uh, the quadratic question. He categorized three cases, and I'm showing you those three cases. And then he is credited with formalizing the Indian place value weighted system of numerals, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the most important number, I believe, is zero in Arabic. Zero is called sifr, is, is more than a placeholder when it came to the Central Asia. The next slide that I wanted to see that Al Khwarizmi's numbers, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, went through are something like this. In the very top is the Arabic Indic way of writing, and then Eastern Arabic Indic in Persian Urdu, then Devnagri from Hindi, which is from India, and Tamil from the south side of India. So those were the equivalent number written, but in once it came to Baithel Hikmah, it went farther, several more. So I want to show you what it went. It actually went to for at least three iterations until we see the modern numbers. Here are the three iterations, 969, 1,082 years, and then 14th century. What you are seeing, what was done in 969 and what is done in 14th century, this is the way the number looks like now. The only difference you can see, the number two, please look at number two. Number two is rotated by 90 degrees. Other than that is exactly the same. So it went through this. The biggest challenge was that two and three have been rotated by 90 degrees and we voila, we got our modern numbers of one, two, three, nine. And we have added a zero from, which is again, with zero that it didn't exist before. So let me try to go a little bit more uh, for the next slide. Is another mathematician, Tabith Ibn Khura. From the ninth century, he conducted both theoretical and observational work in astronomy. He's the first one to create the table of trigonometric functions. And his book on algebra had 69 unique problems. He saw what we call an indices uh, multiplication issue. But important is that he could add and subtract radical using the formula. This is a major advance in the use of irrational coefficients in indeterminate equation. It's a dramatic discovery that essentially leads many other discoveries that happen later on. And all of these were created, being created far, far away from Greece. The next is Omar Khayyam, that name that we all remember is a polymath. He also, he's, he's another, he has actually had authored three fantastic books, one on arithmetic, one happened to be in music, and one on algebra. All three were written before he was age 25. He provided a complete classification of cubic equations, and he calculated a year, happens to be 365 point along, which is about one fourth of a day. With that being said, let me move to, back to India one more time. But this is somewhat a little bit later, but it's important to understand. Once the sine cosine table got established, now back in India, Vashkara between 1114 and 1185, would progress with trigonometry farther and established the sum and differences of the angles. Both sine and cosine was established by Vashkara about a hundred years later. But this needed those sign tables that were created earlier on. One more polymath that I want to, everybody is a polymath. This only polymath I'm going to spend some time is Ibn al Haytham. He is the first person to prove that the light travels in a straight line using scientific methods, not conjecture, not theory, but proving. And he ended up writing a book of optics 
uh, as early as 1021 CE. I'm going to spend a little bit of time. This is the cover of one of the books. The first scientist, meaning somebody who did experiment, and he could repeat the experiment repeatedly to get the same answer. He could change position and he would repeat. So those these techniques of how a science get formalized is was established by him under some very interesting uh, circumstances. So uh, he was born in Iraq. He did all his work in Egypt, but he was born in Iraq. He studied mostly physical work. He became extremely good in engineering, basically construction. So Egypt had this long river called Nile, and the whole civilization is around the Nile and a little bit of you know, crop that grows. And the, if Nile floods, it is good and bad. But they were needed to create a barrage or a dam. So Khalif invited Ibn al Haytham to come and build this dam. Well, he actually, and I, overall summary, he has, he has published 200 works. About 50 of them are still surviving in museums. He is first to provide the description of scientific method. His subjects are wide, optics, astronomy, geometry, mechanics, water clocks, medicine, anatomy, financial, arithmetic, and civil engineering. What I wanted to point out in high, when it came to Cairo, he was brought in to fix the problem of the Nile. But he identified the location where it could be, but he understood that this was beyond his capacity to build anything. And so soon after that, he, well, he really was scared for his life. So he started pretending that he was faking feigning because he did not want to become a victim of wrath of the Khalif. As a result, he was put, luckily for all of us, in prison for a period of 10 years. During 10 years, this is when in the prison he does most of his experiments. And all of his writing, they were generous with paper and everything, and they provided everything as long as he does not cause any trouble, 10 years in consolation. So what is important to know in modern day, when Aswan High Dam was built in Egypt, it happens to be exactly in the same location that Ibn Haytham thought is the best location possible. But that's another story. I want to go back to his story. And what I wanted to know is the first one who was a rectangle who established ray tracing method and a rectilinear propagation of light from object to the eye. He was the first to connect between light to vision. He was the first to observe that brain is the center of vision, not the eye. He was the first to distinguish between primary and secondary sources. He was the first did a non-trivial distribution or demonstration of what we call camera or pinhole camera or camera obscura. And he was the first to observe diffraction phenomena. On the right side, I'm just, just the picture from a journal of medical biography, which picks it up from his creation of how he thought the vision is picked up in the eyes and how it is transmitted to the brain. And you can see Arabic script throughout by telling uh, the description of the methodology of how the vision takes place. So we are aware that Aristotle had a, his vision is affected by a form which came from the visible object to the eye. In the time of Ptolemy and Euclid, the Egyptians, it was somewhat different. They thought of ray, but they thought of ray going from eyes to the object. He was the first to establish that the image is formed by rays arriving from the object. His experiment, this you might consider to be his, is an archish rendition of a building or a room, has a small hole and is picking up the light from the tip of the minaret of the mosque, which is uh, far away. 
and the light is picked up to the pinhole and they are observing as the image has inverted itself and becomes what we call an image. This was a, an experiment that he did, but kept on repeating. And then he wanted to study with multiple objects. So essentially he does this experiment. He used multiple light sources to demonstrate that light followed straight path lines through the holes. And these three lamps could be the same mirror, possibly at three different times of the day. So the shadows are coming at different points in time. That's about this particular experiments, but I would like to go back to tell the anatomy of eye. This two thing that I picked up, both of them actually appeared yesterday in uh, Aramco world. On the left side is the model of vision, except this was recreated by a man from Persia. Kamal al-Farisi, Farisi meaning one who speak Farsi language. And on the right side is Johann John's treatise in optics, 1685. And if you look on the right side, this is like looking at a human like from the very top. And this is the head. And then the two eyes in the front and how, so this is like a map in 1685 by Johannes Johns following what uh, Ibn Haytham has uh, established by, by that time with rays coming in and then going to the eyes and then eventually picked up by the brain. He studied optics and investigated optical properties of mirrors made from conic section. I also needed to tell you that his book of optics, those seven volume, was a required reading at the University of Paris and University of Sorbonne in 13th and 14th centuries. His name, Alhazen, al Haytham became Latinized. He started being called Alhazen. He showed three-dimensional world. How can it be transformed into two-dimensional images? Significantly influenced Renaissance painting, influenced medieval optical researcher, uh, in this case, Roger Bacon. This is an important uh, picture from 1647. This was a, a publication created uh, at the times right after Galileo to celebrate the, the discovery of the studies of the moon. And look on the cover of this book, which is called Selenographia, published in 1647. On the left side, the man on the left side has a piece of paper with a lot of things scribbled. He represents Ibn al-Haytham. And on the right side is Galileo. He has the long telescope. So one, the theoretician, and the other one is the experimentalist who is proving and so if you look in this Selenographia, which was published, all the proofs and diagrams from the conics were handwritten from Ibn al Haytham books, which actually appears in 1647 again. I want to show one more picture. This is important. Also appeared this week. This is a camera obscura from 1754 from the Dictionary of Arts and Sciences. This is an artist aid. So an artist, in order to draw any picture, would actually sit in a small cubicle and will put a small hole and get this whole building's picture inverted, which will appear on the wall of the small compartment. And he can draw right on that wall uh, with the exact dimension as like. So this would be the way a technique that the artist perfected in how to draw architectural drawings. This is a camera obscura from 1558. I have one more here from 1568. This is a lens-based camera obscura. And I want to go back a little bit to complete my story is that in 1422 after Alhazen, he established the idea of experimentation. 
But the next big experimentation took place actually in Uzbekistan, 1420. This is the Ulugbek's madrasa, which is essentially was called a madrasa or a school or a university, and it is all an observatory. So this is before the time of Galilee, the observatory taking place in Uzbekistan. And then in modern times, it is reestablished, recreated somewhat a little bit differently. This is a new construction in 2001 that I see. I want to also take you to India a little bit back again, because the observational uh, idea of looking at the heavens also back went back to India. And this is uh, in the uh, state of Rajasthan, it's a place called Jantar Mantar. If you have a time to visit, go to India, I ask you to go and visit this place. This is an observational celestial observatory that still exists to a certain degree, not functioning, but this is from the time of 1724. I want to go back uh, to our Isaac Newton. I began from him. Uh, a few things that we need to, to know that. We say the laws of reflection, we attribute it to Snell's, Snell's law, except what we completely ignore, the whole Snell's law, including refractive index, was established some 500 years ago in Iran by Ibn Sal. I just wanted to make that statement. And since that time, since Snell's time, I'm sorry, uh, since nine, uh, Farmer's principle was around 1662. Higgins published his book in 1690. And Newton's, he published his optics and solidified corpuscular particle theory of light in another hundred years or so. That says, so if I look at coming back from India, back from Central Asia, from Ibn Sal, and then I can go down the storybook to just tell you where it is. And I'm nearing the my close to my end of the presentation, just to get you since the first experiment, uh, the folks in the Far East did not sit idle. The first to be noticed is Satyan Bose, who is the discoverer of bosons and statistics, and therefore boson while you are, he was a professor at University of Dhaka in current Bangladesh. Chandrasekhar Raman, who is, uh, won his Nobel Prize because of his Raman effect. Subramaniam Chandrasekhar for looking at the evolution of star. Ali Javan, credited with discovering helium minimum laser from Iran. Charles Cow, who won his Nobel Prize in 2009, but he created fiber lasers. Ahmed Jewel, who's credited for his discoveries in ultra-fast laser chemistry from Egypt. And more recently, Isamu Akasaki, Hiroshi Amano, and Shuji Nakamura, who are the discoverer of blue LEDs. And I want to wrap it up by just sharing with you. So if I look at all the element particle, the top two rows are quarks and the bottom two are leptons, and the right two columns, the right two extreme right columns are all bosons. And if I look, go under the bosons, these are gluon photons and Z boson and W boson. And if I look at scalar boson, that's Higgs. So in some sense, uh, I'm reconnecting how the studies of the photons or photonics was clearly contributed to also by people somewhere else. I, I think last but not least, I wanted to share with you this particular slide. This is an interesting slide. I took it from an advertisement for an oscilloscope. And so this oscilloscope is kind of, kind of depicting what would Ibn al-Haytham do if he had a laptop and if he had his oscilloscope? This is my last of the slides. Thank you very much. And I hope, and I thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, I believe I kept the promise of staying around about 40 minutes or thereabout. 
So if you have a question, I'll be more than happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Karim, uh, for uh, such a nice talk. I mean, uh, history from going back before the Christ time, uh, pre-Christ time to up to modern times, we covered a lot of, uh, a lot of things here especially focusing on the Middle East area from the uh, 7th to 11th century time frame, a lot of things happened there. So mm -hmm. it was very nice to hear that. Uh, I think at this point we can uh, take the questions. So I, let me see, there is a one question on the chat. So let me open up the chat here. Um, so let's see. Uh, so if you want, you can also look through the chat or you want to read it. Uh, you can look at the yeah. chat directly and answer yeah, the questions. Uh, yeah, it's just a comment. Thank you very much. I appreciate it that I had an opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. Okay. And the second one is, uh, oh, that's also just a comment. Yes. I, yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So anyone has any question to ask at this point? So let me begin by just asking the question about this. I think you mentioned the history of uh, uh, Sifra, Zip, or Zero, I mean, what we call Zero here. Yes. Yes. Shunya in Sanskrit, we call it Shunya. Yes. Uh, yes. So you said that was sort of um, first time done in sixth century or seventh century. Is that correct? I mean, nobody before that had the concept of zero. No, it actually goes back to Chinese mathematics that I share with. Even they so, had so, so, similar concept of okay. zero or Shunya in India. It preceded yeah, yeah. also in China, and uh, possibly was not formalized tremendously, but it got formalized more so in Baghdad later. Right. I mean, I have read that even Babylonians had some idea of it. I mean, kind of, they were using the concept without introducing a notation, I think, kind of. Yes, uh, they, they are. So I had actually, I read a few articles on hieroglyphs and for, I think you are referring to Sumerians and, Oh, yes, Sumerian. yes, oh, yeah, right, right. Sumerian right. scripts. Again, you could think that there was an understanding of the zero, except it was never formalized by anyone. Right, right. So I see there's a new question on the chat. If you want to take that question, we can uh, answer that. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it just says recording is on so everyone in the meeting can see and save messages sent to everyone and, and can. No, it does well, not. See. I see one message from Peter the Groot. Let me read it there. Yes, please. Are there comparable contributions from Mesoamerica and South America or from uh, pre colonial civilizations? I have actually, by the way, I have begun studying this. This very, thank you for telling this. Uh, Perhaps the readings that I have so far, please understand they have built those structure, very tall structure. There was a lot of construction in the Mayan times. And so engineering was not necessarily unknown to them, but what is lacking is perhaps no script that exists anywhere there was either it went back to Europe before the start of Renaissance or not. So I think the gap here is from this region, nothing went there, but from Central Asia for about 700 years, the language of science was Arabic. So all this uh, manuscript got created into Latin and eventually to every other languages such as Italian, German, Spanish, and so forth. This same phenomenon didn't take place in South American case, but you can see and you can appreciate those, this construction. There was a lot of thinking behind this construction, definitely. Thank you. I, th I think Professor Moore has a question. Uh, yes, go please. ahead, Duncan. I gotta unmute myself first. Um, I'm curious, since the equivalent of Snell's law was known long before Snell. And one of the issues I'm kind of interested in is it was well known that the, the time of the rising sun or the moon or the stars is affected by the refraction of the atmosphere. Yes. 
and uh, what we call the gradient in the atmosphere. Is there any evidence that anybody at that time used some sort of what I'll call a shell model to, to you know, indicate the refraction by just taking a series of homogeneous shells that were spherical that would account for that? No, the idea of the series came a little bit later. So people had to break, say, sine x into a series or a cosine x to a series. This formulation has not has happened because it had to wait for the algebraic manipulation. I don't recall that I see any such scripts like that, but because you just planted something in my head, I'm going to look around, OK? OK, well, I'm curious about that. I, I found a reference in 1750. OK, I'm going, I'm going to track it. OK, so if, if you've come across something, I'm interested in it because it's really the first example of gradient index optics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I see several hands have been raised now. So Tom, you want to go ahead with your question? Uh, yes, thank, thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm, it, it's fascinating to learn about uh, the different records. What I'm wondering about is how the various knowledge uh, that was discovered or developed or communicated in different regions was affected by the migration routes and the trade routes of the time. So for example, in Central Asia, you have the Silk Road. Uh, that connected uh, China to Central Asia to what we now know as the Middle East. Um, and um, and you can sort of track languages to some degree in that direction. Has there been any evidence of these these scientific ideas also sort of following along these trade routes? And I think this also relates to the question of South America. How How did people actually get there? In the case of Central Asia, it is correct because the people who just go and get some books and translate it didn't happen like this. You actually also got the person who wrote the book sometime bring it up. So they came through the trade routes. So you will see, at least in the case, case of House of Wisdom, that House of Wisdom was created where all these road kind of converge from India, from Persia, from China, as well as from the West side, from Greece onward. So all of these were brought in, they just formalized it so that for about, as I say, 25 to 30 years was about translation. And then for another 50 to 60 years is actually experimentation of the work. And then it was again dispersed because by that time, during the 700 years, if you look a little bit closely also, the Arabic was also a language as far north as in Spain where um, Arabs were there for about 750 years. So it went from the north side of Africa and then crossed through the Mediterranean, through Gibraltar, into Spain, and these are the trade routes and how the right routes, routes led the knowledge coming in and how the knowledge going out. So that's very well documented. What is not documented, at least I'm not aware of, is the doc. And I think that is the reason why we don't have enough documented thing, except in the form of drawings, wall drawings, as far as the case in Central America is. Slightly different. Jim, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, yes, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm intrigued by the comment you made earlier about the estimation of pi being um, a number divided by either 2,000 or 20,000. I, I forgot the exact um, uh, numbers. But what was the origin of that understanding and, and approximation? How did um, the original author of that uh, come to that point? A lot of these were from the idea of the conics and the idea of conics. So people wanted to, in order to understand a circle, to create a circle, they created polygons, except they increased 
the sides of the polygons. In the case of China, Chinese case, the polygon side went up to 192. I think that stopped at 192. So by that time, you have a very, a circle, almost a close to truth circle with a polygon that has got 192 sides. If today, if we were to discretize a circle, it may not be too different than those 192 spots, but it is those kind of uh, putting a geometrical figure within a circle and well, or at least by creating polygons of, of more numbers of side, they were getting close to a circle and that would help them understand what is the ratio between the circumference and the radius, for example. And that's how they were approaching the calculation of pi. But I think the, what Jim was saying that the R, I think the seventh century when Aryabhata had that thing where he divided something by 20,000, 65 something divided by 20,000, he was not doing this uh, polygon things within a circle. No, he, he did, he did not do this, he did not. Yeah, so it was some other idea he had when yes. he was divided by 20,000, I think. Yes. That, yeah, yeah that, that, that was my question. I was wondering what idea he used to get to that approximation. That was my question. Oh, yeah. No, the books that I have read on this does not tell what led to these ideas. It's like, here is what he did. And I'm just saying it's kind of estimated about 20,000 times. But no, I think his approximation is very good. He came at 3.1416. That's yeah, yeah, very, very accurate. Close. I mean, that's very, very, very close. <laughs> yeah, very close. Yes. Uh, I see there's a question by Pablo on the chat. Pablo, you want to go ahead and, and say your question? If you're still there. So uh, I can read you. This is on the chat also. It has been found that the eyes of ancient Egyptian sculptures were made out of glass and they reproduce carefully the cornea and crystalline. Are yeah. you aware of somebody doing research? I'm aware of topic? this, yes. I'm aware of this. Right, so he's just asking that, uh, are you aware of somebody doing research on that topic? Do you know somebody doing research on that topic? No, I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm aware of this topic. Yeah. All right, any other questions before we call it quit for today? Last minute questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kareem. Thank it you. was wonderful. It. Be, be, it would have been much better if you could come in person. So, I mean, it would have been yeah, yeah, better. I'm sorry. That it didn't happen. Happen. <laughs> thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, all right. Okay, bye, bye everyone. Bye.